Well, good to be back with you again uh, for a message that, uh, pretty well one-shot message. It's not a series, but we're looking at uh, a message that I've titled Seven Things. Seven Things. We're going to turn look at Proverbs uh, chapter 6. You know, Proverbs is a unique book that that really has a, uh, a special purpose. It's it's to give us wisdom as the people of God, uh, and this wisdom is grounded and rooted in the fear of God, the reverence of God, and it's and this wisdom is meant to to help us work out a life that's that we're joined with God Almighty through this covenant relationship by our faith in in. Jesus as the rule of our daily life. So Proverbs and the other wisdom books has a very practical application to our relationship with the Lord. You know, other books in the Old Testament uh, that are considered wisdom books are Job and Ecclesiastes and the Song of Solomon. Uh, Some of Psalms can be placed in the category of the wisdom books as well. Uh, But within Proverbs, there's these practical uh, warnings and encouragements uh, for those of us who stand in the grace of God through our faith in the Son of God. Uh, so if you want to turn in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 6, we'll start in verse 16 through 19. And the writer of Proverbs says, There are six things that Yahweh, the Lord, hates, seven that are an abomination to him. Number one, haughty eyes. Number two, a lying tongue. Number three, hands that shed innocent blood. Number four, a heart that devises wicked plans. Five, feet that make haste to run to evil. Uh, Six, a false witness who breathes out lies. And then the seventh one, which in my opinion is one of the most uh, worst of the, of the seven, uh, is a truly abomination to God Almighty, and that is the one who sows discord among the brethren. Uh, so as you can see, the writer of Proverbs doesn't beat around the bush. He uses the one true name of God, Yahweh, who is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and uh, he emphasizes uh, that God hates these six things. Seven is an abomination to him. And, and you know, you might think it's odd to, to hear the word hatred or hate connected to God Almighty, but you've got to understand that God's hatred is just like his judgment. He's, he's a God of love, but he's a God of justice. Uh, and, and his hatred of these things is just a response. Uh, to things that are not a part of God's nature. His hatred is not some pleasure he gets out of, uh, God gets out of doing to his human creatures, but it's just, you know, he's talking about practices of, of the human experience that are completely against the will of God and the kingdom of God. So it's kind of like the human body. Uh, when a virus enters the body, the immune system detects of the infection and activates defenses, including white blood cells and and uh, antibodies that fight off this intruding virus. So, in the similar way, the system of the world and the flesh of men, they are intruders into the will and nature of God, and in in defense of the will of God, those things that are identified as sin, they become the enemies of God, and His good pleasure. So here in Proverbs, the writer lists six things that God opposes, and even a seventh one that is an abomination. You know, I I think we can assume that an abomination uh, is even more of a description of uh, boy, this 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 really concrete and 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 how God is so disgusted uh, in this behavior. Uh, it, it it would you would think it would cause God to recoil in in rejection and uh, practicing these things automatically brings forth His divine discipline and and even judgment. So I would hope 
we all can agree that it's just simply not a good pras- practice to live out our short existence on earth uh, doing these things, practicing these things, being part of these things that God hates and that are an abomination to him. I mean, it's, it's not brain surgery. Uh, people of faith, we're people of faith. If you're a people of faith, we must understand that there is wisdom that God gives his people generously. The Apostle James even wrote that, you know, if you want to know what God wants you to do, ask him, and he will gladly tell you. He'll gladly give you wisdom without finding fault, his wisdom, for, which is from above in the kingdom. And so loving God means we place value on his will and nature. Love God with all your heart, your mind, your spirit, your soul, your strength. Loving God means we place great value on what his will and his nature is. We understand that the reverence of God is the beginning of knowing him. You know, loving our neighbor gives us an opportunity to to live out our love for God and our faith in his promises. So what are the six and even seven things that the God of creation poses. Well, let's look at them. First, we're told God hates haughty eyes. Uh, this, This refers to a proud view of yourself, a proud view of oneself. You know, we, we end up exalting ourselves, sometimes unknowingly, uh, before other people. Um, the I, in most of, of biblical language, it refers to our uh, focus, our view of things, what we esteem. Uh, Jesus made the reference, for example, that the I, if your eye is single, then your whole body will be full of light. If you'll seek first, in other words, the kingdom of God, then all these other things shall be added. So, you know, the teachings of Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, it it should bring every follower of Jesus to their senses and uh, and, and really start examining uh, our own hearts. Uh, about our own pride. Just, just listen to some of most of Matthew chapter six, the teachings of Jesus. He says, "Beware." Now, that's a warning, friends. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. He goes on to say, "When you give to help the needy, don't sound a trumpet before you as." the hypocrites do in the synagogue and in the streets so that they can be praised by others. And when you pray, Jesus said, you must not be like the hypocrites for they love to, you know, stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they can be seen by others. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites for they disfigure their faces uh, so that their fasting may be seen by others. Uh, you know, if you're like me, you've you've committed uh, wrongdoing on every last one of those. I mean, uh, all of them uh, really bring out um, bring out uh, some things in our own heart and our own life that uh, you know we we are guilty of. You know, you know, those four verses would probably do away with 90 percent of social media. I mean, it really would, because that's about what social media is primarily about. You know, I I remember many years ago when I had a a Saturday outreach, inner city outreach. And I first got on Facebook. I was I was constantly boasting about all that we did in our outreach. Uh, You know, I was taking selfies of me right and left pictures of me all, you know, with those that we serve, our homeless friends, special speakers. I was always touting the numbers of meals we served. Uh, you know, the people who came to fa- faith in Christ. I wanted to brag on that. Uh, the number of people that showed up at these events, you know, if we had 300, I wanted to make sure everybody knew we packed the house. You know, all the different people that came to help, uh, you know, I wanted people to know. And I how many meals we served. It, it was all about me and my ministry. So 
I came to some point, uh, some point later on, and it's it's amazing. It was after watching someone else on social media do the very same thing I was doing that kind of made God put a mirror in front of me and said, that's what you look like. And I thought, whoa, that's pretty immature. That's pretty prideful. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's outrageously prideful because uh, this guy was self and putting selfies, filling my timeline with selfies day, all day long. So, so what do you think the motivation, what do you think I figured out was my motivation that I wouldn't admit at the time? I, but what was the motivation behind my constant boasting about my ministry? Well, it starts off with my immaturity and my thinking, you know, and, and I really wanted to let people know what God was doing at our outreaches. But hidden underneath all that boasting was that continual need that, I, that we had for financial backing to continue our ministry and growing our ministry. You go, wow, David, you're really being honest here. Yes, I am. You know, people outside of the outreach, uh, outside of the church, they they were people all over the place. Churches giving into our inner city outreach that we had for several years. And I wanted to make sure that they knew what God was doing in and through our ministry, and it was worth donating to. And you go, oh, boy, are you sure? I said, well, looking back, yes, I'm sure. You know, some might say, well, well, what's so wrong about letting people know about these things? Well, listen, I'm not saying there isn't a place for that, but I believe it's probably within the church in private meetings with those involved in the ministry, uh, maybe on the announcements within our own church family. Uh, to boast about these things on social media and throughout various publications you know, uh, for the masses to see. To be honest, if you'll notice, many people, if you ever notice underneath in the comment section on social media, you'll notice many people end up praising the man behind the ministry. How great he or she is, instead of just knowing that I always put, oh, thank God the Father at the end of all my boasting. Don't get me wrong. I always made sure God got the final, his two cents in there. But trust me, instead of just knowing that God the Father knows what's going on. I don't have to announce it uh, and be content with that. Uh, that just wasn't in my mindset. And you know, the fascinating part of this, people are more than glad to exalt others who boast and brag about their work. It takes two to tango for the glory of God, of course. You always got to put that in there. And then there are many who are more than happy to give these people, you know, in the comments section, a big thumbs up. Hey, you're doing a great job, Pastor. Hey, you're a blessing, Pastor. You're the best. Keep up the good work. You know, it literally feeds the pride within me. It literally feeds the pride, the ego. And and so at, at some point, the Lord finally uh, got through my thick skull. I learned a valuable lesson that God will take care of his ministry. It's his work. And I don't have to brag or boast to others about it to convince them that how great a ministry it is. You know, so, so you know, I, um, I, I'm working very hard to stay out of that realm of boasting. If I'm going to boast, I'm going to boast about the Word of God and give uh, information on maybe a particular event or something on social media, but I'm, I'm not going to... I'm not going to flash my picture up there every five seconds and, and, and how wonderful I am and, and, and how wonderful our ministry is and look at all this and look at all. I just saying it ain't happening anymore. That, those scriptures in Matthew 6 just rip me apart. They tear my heart apart because, you know, I lost my reward every time I boasted about what uh, we were doing in our ministry. I lost the reward because I got my reward by the hand clapping from everybody else. Now, the second thing it says in Proverbs that God hates and opposed to, and that is a lying tongue. Deception. Deception is what this means. It's, it's, it's a tongue that deceives, it disappoints, and it betrays. Okay? It deceives, it disappoints, and it betrays. Uh, this one in particular really convicts me as a person. 
because a lying tongue covers such a wide spectrum of deception, friends. I want you to hear this out. A lying tongue can be so subtle that many can be deceived without realizing they're deceiving, or even when they know they're deceiving, that they're they're it's subtle. You know, all you have to do, friends, to be deceptive is this: when when you're speaking to someone about a certain situation, all you have to do is change up a couple of words. Say it with different tones in your voice, like, did you hear Pastor David? Or, hey, did you hear Pastor David? I mean, different tones send messages. <laughs> Come on. We're, 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 listen, we're, we're opening up the wound. Clear open today. They can say it with different tones, different fluctuations of their speech, and the real truth has all of a sudden been changed into a deception. 90% of it may be true, but there's enough falsehood thrown in there that might cause someone to doubt or to question what they thought was the truth. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm torn with conviction over this one, friends. I, it requires real deep, honest humility, transparency, and it requires constant examination of my own heart so that I can keep my tongue from falsely hurting or even slightly deceiving anyone. You know, the amount of time throughout my life that I was deceptive is simply out, or I just simply outright lied, even to people I love. There's no way to put a number to it, because I did it a lot. I've, I've, I've done it an awful lot. Thank God for his grace. You know, I'm reminded of the words of Jesus. He put it very bluntly, very straight to the point. In Matthew 12, 36, he goes, but let me say something to you. He says that every idle, careless, lazy, thoughtless, unprofitable, injurious word men speak, they will give an account of it on the day of judgment. For by your words, you will be justified, and by your words, you will be condemned. Oh, my God, God the Father, my Lord Jesus, have mercy on us all. For we all find ourselves guilty and in need of your grace. You know, the words of the Apostle Paul say the similar things concerning our tongue. How great a forest, in James chapter 3, how great a forest is set ablaze by such a little fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body of Christ setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell itself. That's the source. That's the source of lies, deceptions, uh, half-truths. It's, it's, it's from hell. That's the source. And my friends, we need to weep over this. I wept over this message as I wrote it down on Saturday morning. We need to lay ourselves bare before the one who will judge every intent and motive of our heart. Search my heart, O Lord. Show me any wicked way that I might turn and seek your mercy. I want you to think on that for a moment. Now, the third thing that is opposed to the will of God that he hates, and that is hands, hands that shed innocent blood. You know, the hands and the feet represent instruments of our human body that carries out the intents of our heart, hands that raise up lies and deception and hatred and hurt against those that are actually guiltless, clean, and innocent. You know, these, these are those people that they, they literally oppose the will of God Almighty. You know, they pronounce blame on the innocent, withholding love for their brother without understanding the whole story you know, murdering the innocent, both in society and within the body of Christ. You know, the Bible uh, clearly teaches that there is a physical murder and there is a spiritual murder. The Apostle John writes about it in his first letter, chapter 3, verse 12, do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother Abel. Why did he murder him? Because his own actions were wrong and his brothers were right. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, 
And you know, and if you don't know now, you know now. And you know, John says, that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Again, God have mercy on us all. Father in heaven, put your finger on all that's causing me to lift my hand against the innocent. The fourth thing that God hates is a heart that devises wicked plans. This refers to our inner man, our soul, our, our comprehending mind and reason and affections that, that literally, uh, this says, plows through. It, it works at, it practices habitually what they know is against the very nature of God Almighty. You know, the meaning in Hebrew is that a person schemes. You know, that, that's what devise, devises uh, uh, wicked plans. They, they actually scheme and they plan and they plot out any way to fulfill their own lust and desires. The Apostle John again speaks on along this lines. He says, no one who abides in Christ keeps on practicing what he knows is wrong. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, and he as he is righteous. So whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil's been sinning from the beginning. The fifth thing that God hates, we see in Proverbs, is feet that makes haste to run to evil. Again, here the feet, like the hands, are referring to our physical instruments that are used to follow. Feet follow. When we follow our lusts and desires, we are quick, we are many times anxious, maybe even impulsive to run to those things that we know are wrong and evil. We can easily deceive ourselves. We can easily just be deceived by that evilness if, if we continue in it. We soon discover at some point down the road, if we continue practicing those things we know good and well we're not supposed to, that it only leaves, leads to decay and death. Now, the sixth thing that God hates, a false witness who breathes out lies. The Hebrew word for false witness holds this uh, very deep meaning concerning what it means to be a false witness. It, it, it's, it means it's, it's known deception and dishonesty. A false witness will wrongfully talk about another person with lies, deception, and vain words. Again, the writer of Proverbs uses the actions of our human body, the hands, the feet, uh, and now breathing, breathing, to describe how a person makes false statements. These false statements come from within our heart. You know, these people speak as if they're an eyewitness to what they're bearing false witness about. That, that what they say is a true testimony, and they claim to hold evidence for their lies. But they are deceiving themselves. And for the most part, they speak these falsehoods from a hurt deep inside of them, a wound within themselves or from someone they love. Again, God hates false and deceptive witnesses, lies. Now, the final seventh thing that God hates, but yes, is an abomination even to God, is one who sows discord among brothers. One who sows discord among the brotherhood, the church. The Hebrew word for souls holds an interesting meaning. It means a person who bids farewell, thinned away, cast off and divorce in an accusatory manner his fellow brothers or sisters. They accuse and they send off by discord and by strife. These people live in a state of condition of contention and dissension marked by a lack of agreement or harmony instead of trying to keep peace in the midst of disagreement. Let me say that again. These are people who still will accuse and use discord and strife to, to keep this lack of agreement or harmony that should be a part of the body of Christ. 
Instead of peace, they talk about it. They bring discord. They send off. They send away. They bid farewell. They cast off. They divorce themselves. And they, they feel like they're justified in doing so. They sow discord and strife, not just in the general society, but more importantly, this is referring to discord among the brotherhood of Christ. The brotherhood of Christ. What, what is it? What's the source of discord and, discord and strife? Well, the Bible tells us that the unfiltered truth concerning that question lies in the fact that the base foundation for all discord in the family of God is hatred. Hatred. You go, what? I don't hate anybody. I just don't like. No. The base foundation for discord is hatred. Do you want to call God a liar? Do you want to call the Bible untruth? Let me read. Let me close by reading this out of Proverbs. Whoever, whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but he who makes his ways crooked will be found out. Whoever winks the eye, hey, causes trouble. Hey, did you hear about Pastor David? Hey there. And a babbling fool will come to ruin. But the mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life. The mouth of the wicked conceals violence. And here it is. Hatred stirs up strife. But love covers all offenses. That's Proverbs. Seven things the Lord hates and is abomination to him. A lot to think about, dear friends. Okay, until next time, may God bless.